6.33. Um, I'd like to welcome our guests, and we will go around and do some introductions just so everyone knows who is who. Um, notice that we have our first run of some name tags made by the graphics arts of RTCC, so you have a little idea who we are if you have good eyesight. Um, my name is Laura Rocha. I represent Brookfield here on the OSSD board. Lane Millington, superintendent. I'm Rachel Gatiss. I'm a representative from uh, Braintree. I'm Linda Lubold. I take the minutes. I'm Ann Kaplan. I'm a representative from Randolph. I'm <laughs> Ann Howard. I'm a representative from Braintree. Paul Putney from Randolph. Brian Baker from Brookfield. Ashley Lincoln, Randolph Center. Melody DeGloria, Randolph. Would you mind telling us who you are sure. as well? I'll start. I'm Jeffrey Francis. I'm from the Vermont Superintendents Association. I'm Mark McDonald, representing these towns in the Senate. North Solnick, uh, teacher and uh, citizen. <laughs> I'm Peter Reed. I'm the newest representative uh, for this district replacing Ben Chicken. I'm from Braintree. Paul Kendall, Braintree. I'm Hannah Arias, from Randolph President. I'm Betsy Shands, teacher at Braintree. I'm Michelle Kleskevich, a teacher at Braintree. Betsy Baker, speech language pathologist at Braintree and RU, and also a citizen. Deb Chamberlain, para at Braintree, and um, live in Randolph. Uh, Tev Kelman, I teach English and Social Studies here at the high school. And Beth Osha, a school nurse at RES. I'm Steve Foreman, I'm a middle school math teacher here. Thank you very much. Welcome to the meeting. So um, the focus of our meeting today is to, to hear from our legislators and um, from Jeff Francis of the Vermont Principals Association. And we're going to start with that, um, just an update on what's going on in the legislature and in the education in, in the state. So do you have a time in mind? We allowed 60 minutes for you. Okay. Um, I think. Representative Hooper's expected, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I, how do you, do you want to approach us? The same way we usually do. Just okay. So I can give an Let overview. Us. Oh, if I do that, what I'd like to do, if nobody objects, is move my chair over there, so I don't have my back to all these. Yeah, that would be That's great. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll start uh, the way I have in the years past, which is to. Um, well, as a citizen myself and as the executive director of the Superintendents Association, um, Sue Siglowski, who's the executive director of the School Boards Association, couldn't be with me tonight, but she sends her greetings and regards. Um, the only difference, had she been here, is we probably would have divided some of these things that we'll talk about. And I wanted to thank you for your service, um, the teachers, the staff in the school system, and school board members, because as you all know, um, we have a public education system in Vermont which is focused on best service to children, attention to affordability and taxpayers, and none of it really works unless we've got a lot of contribution from you as school board members and from you as teachers and staff, so thank you. Um, I have the benefit of working in Montpelier, um, trying to follow what happens in the General Assembly, and then in sessions like this, or in written material, or in, for me, conversations with superintendents, conveying to people what we see happening under the Golden Dome. And um, I would say this year is somewhat remarkable for the sheer amount of legislation that's under consideration. We're in the second half of a biennium, um, each of the last four or five years has been characterized in and of itself with what I would consider to be major pieces of legislation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that legislation tonight, but um, the, the acts and the subject matter will be familiar um, either in its entirety to all of you or um, in part uh, to, to, to some of you. Um, so the the where we are in the delivery system of public education today is trying to contend with a lot of law and regulation which is intended to 
create better opportunities for kids um, and to do it in a, in a sensible way. I want to pause here and say what I'm doing is communicating to you the knowledge and information that I have. Hey, Jay, how are you? Um, about these laws and regulations. Some of them I supported, perhaps some of them I haven't. So I'm not here to like say that um, I and the Superintendent Association are in favor or opposed. I'm just telling you what's happening. Um, so in, in recent years, as you know, we had Act 166, which was the unification law. Um, excuse me, Act 166, which was universal access to pre-K. Um, Act 46, which was the merger law. Um, Act uh, 173, which is support for struggling students. Act 77, proficiency-based learning. It's, it is a challenge uh, and, and multiple pathways um, for students. So uh, I'll circle back and say none of it can be done and be done well without the work that you're doing and without the work that you're doing. And I think many people are challenged by it. One of the um, interests that I had in this legislative session was just the sheer volume of legislation that has been introduced or is under consideration. Uh, we're not sure where it's going to end up, but it's an extraordinarily dynamic session, perhaps more dynamic than others, despite the fact that these major laws have been passed. So what I'll do is just talk to you a little bit about what I observe as the Executive Director of the Superintendents Association, um, and then open it to questions and comments from the legislators. So. The Senate and the House have taken a different approach to the legislative session this year. So um, in the House, where Jay is on the House Education Committee, there is a real focus on literacy and support for literacy through our educational process. Um, in some ways, it's residual to Act 173, because Act 173, which is a bill intended to bring more resources to bear for students who struggle had a major emphasis on literacy. So the House Education Committee is focused um, on literacy specifically, particularly with regard, and I think this is something that we should all welcome, to providing more resources to school systems rather than asking for things from the school systems. And I can talk a little bit about that, Bill. Um, there is also um, a major effort in the House Education Committee on trying to address some of the provisions of Act 166, which is universal access to pre-kindergarten education, in order to make that law work better for school systems and private providers alike. And I can talk about that, but the main points in that bill are to end what I would call the bifurcated administration system. So currently the construct of the law relies on the Agency of Human Services and the Agency of Education to work together to support the delivery of pre-K through private providers and public schools. And I would say the aspect of that law that's working the best is the aspect which has the delivery of public education for pre-kindergarten um, students um, at the local level. So I would say that in most instances, the private providers and the school districts are getting along reasonably well. The administration of that law jointly between the AOE and AHS has not worked as well. So it's been hard for people to get answers to questions. It's been hard to get technical resources into place. It's been hard to get answers under that bifurcated system. I'm going to pause here and say there are maybe people here in the audience, uh, there may be people, if this was broadcast statewide, who would say, that's not my experience, and I'd say that's true. So one of the things about when the state involves itself in the delivery of public education, you need to do an evaluation, which takes place across the state, and not everybody's experience is the same, and that's a struggle when you try to get laws changed. But, but the emphasis um, in the House Education Committee around that law right now is to end the bifurcated um, administration system to make the AOE responsible for the delivery of pre-K in the public schools, to make um, uh, Agency of Human Services and the Child Development Division responsible for the delivery of services and private providers, um, 
that has um, got a long way to go as a piece of legislation, but that's what under is under conversation in the House Education Committee right now. Um, in addition to that, and this is something that I think is going to largely be welcomed if it comes to pass, and it's questionable whether it will come to pass, is there's a real emphasis in the House in trying to get um, a reinstatement of school construction aid. So there's not been any state aid for school construction since 2007. And what we're seeing in the absence of state aid for school construction is school buildings that should be refurbished or renovated um, and uh, the resources aren't available to do it. And I want to come back to that statement in a minute. Um, depending on where you are in the state, um, the needs vary from um, addressing you know, situations that might be attributable to a lack of investment in the school or modernization of school facilities up until 2007 when um, the uh, school construction program ended the state had a say in the allocation of dollars to support school construction and because they were providing um, dollars to support school construction they were able to target the resources in places and in activities that they wanted to support. In the absence of school construction aid, what's happening is that some districts where voters will approve major investments in terms of renovation and refurbishment of buildings, they're moving ahead with projects. So you may have seen in the media, Winooski School District did a $50 million project, Burlington did a $77 million school project, South Burlington's got a proposal for a $209 million project. Um, meanwhile, over at um, Mount Abraham uh, School District, they've tried for three successive votes to get, starting with $50 million and declining because they keep trimming back the money, investment into buildings that sorely needed and the voters aren't passing the, the bond votes there. So you can see where when you rely on the current education funding system, if projects are passed in certain communities and defeated in others in the absence of um, state aid for school construction, equity issues that manifest themselves through the condition and availability of, um, of buildings um, are exacerbated in terms of uh, some places are moving ahead and other places aren't. So the, you know, basically the infrastructure for schools in Vermont um, is about a 1960 um, vintage. And, you know, we're now uh, 70, well, well, 60 years past that. And most of the buildings uh, don't have a, a useful life that was intended to go that long. Although, what year was this building built? Good in the 50s. Yeah. Well, every time I come into this building, I look at the condition of it, and I think, you know, I haven't like poked into every nook and cranny, but when you walk into the building and look at the condition that it's in, I think you've got a lot to be proud of in terms of how these buildings have been maintained over the years. It's not the same picture every place. What exacerbates that issue, and I apologize for giving you this much detail, I hope you have some interest in it. You know, in many places in Vermont, we're seeing precipitous declines in um, student enrollment, right? right. Uh, precipitous. So schools that you know might have been built to house um, 140 kids or 150 kids now have 60 or 70 kids. I know that your trends in this school district are not that. I've had conversations with Lane um, and others about what's happening in terms of the increases in student enrollment that you're seeing. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, this issue of school construction aid is something that's foremost in the minds of House members in particular. Um, and this is how the conversation goes. We know there's been a moratorium since 2007. We know that we should reinstate it for some of the reasons that I indicated. We're not sure where the money's going to come from to do it because the state is stressed in terms of monetary resources. And even if... Um, school construction aid was reinstated tomorrow, 
the state would have to contend with how they would want to allocate the money. In other words, what priorities would they want to point toward in terms of utilization of those dollars? Um, because there is likely to be um, a fair amount of demand when and if um, school construction aid is reinstated. So that's another big issue. Um, one issue which you should all be paying attention to, um, and we're not sure how this is going to play out, although um, I would uh, wager that it will play out, is the so-called waiting study. And um, what that is about is as a result of Act 173, which moves the funding system for um, special education from a, a reimbursement model to a census block model. Um, as part of that law, there was a waiting study commission that was intended to look at the weights that are applied to different student characteristics currently. And the reason for that is because the weights that are utilized in Vermont largely track grade configuration and um, English language learners. And there have not been weights for um, rurality and uh, probably insufficient weights for poverty. So the, um, the state commissioned a study by um, Professor Tammy Colby, who's an education finance expert at the University of Vermont, and a, and a nationally known um, education finance expert um, whose name is Bruce Baker at Rutgers University. And they completed a study which looked at Vermont, its weighting system in the context of its education funding system, its, uh, its weighting system in the context of Act 173 and the potential shift to a census block model, and it took a look at um, both Vermont characteristics and national characteristics in terms of education funding systems, and what they determined is that the weights that we currently rely on are, um, I think for lack of a better term, I could say not reliable in, in, in this era, okay? So what they've done is they've made recommendations for adjusting the weights but when you adjust the weights, you affect equalized pupils because ADM and weights convert to equalized pupils. Equalized pupils are the denominator in the ed spending for pupil calculation which, from which your tax rate is derived, okay? So to put it in simplest terms, the way your tax rates are configured um, and this is a relatively simplistic presentation, but this is how it works. You have your budget, you have your equalized pupils. Um, the result of that equation is um, your ed spending per pupil. Your ed spending per pupil is how your tax <laughs> rates are determined. Um, I won't talk about CLA and et cetera, but. So what happens is when the weights change, the factors that affect your ADM change the equalized pupils. Okay, so if you're dealing in a community where the predominant weights are um, age and grade configurations, you have an equalized pupil. If the weights change to put more emphasis, for example, on poverty or rurality, the it's not a potential. The fact is that in every community in Vermont, that equalized pupils are going to change, and they're going to change on a basis of new factors, right? right. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you go online and look at that report, you can actually look up um, the school district and see what happens based on some of the scenarios that are run. Mm -hmm. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Uh, it's important as an exercise on its face, but it's also important because um, legislators and local school officials are taking a look at what happens based on the various options that are presented in that report. And in some instances, tax rates could rise and fall by as much as 40 cents, all right? Mm -hmm. So the second point that's important to acknowledge is that it's a zero-sum game. So the, the exercise of changing weights does not produce any more money. It basically just redistributes equalized pupils 
so that the calculations change. Now, if you took a look at this outside of political context and outside the fact that it needs to be practically applied when and if the law changes, you might say, you know, my golly, what are we going to do? And some legislators are, I mean, we're starting to hear that already. Letters are being written. Um, Dan French, Secretary of Education, made a presentation on the House Ways and Means Committee uh, last week or the week before where he said he thought that the General Assembly needed to act. Um, over in the Senate Education Committee, um, Senator Baruth, who's the chair there, <coughs> is familiar with this waiting study. He's familiar with the resulting dynamics. He said that perhaps the most prudent way to approach this is through a phased-in approach. But in a, in a system where there are perceptions of lack of resources, perhaps in your community you'll say, we have a lack of resources, in another community, which you might know of, you might say they have an abundance of resources, the potential for a conflict or a contest as you try to navigate this is very real. Um, so what we're encouraging people to do is read the report, understand what it could mean in your district, be prepared for legislative conversations when they start. They haven't started in earnest yet. And to the best of our ability, keep in mind that we're really dealing with a system which is a system of public education uh, for the entire state. But there are, you know, underlying these conversations is this whole issue of um, equity. How do we have an equitable system? How do we be responsible to every kid and every community? And how do you navigate the potential for change associated with something which could be quite big in terms of its, its impact? Um, in terms of the... Um the report itself, I mean, the big question that I had about it, as I was kind of thinking through stuff over the last day or two, is as they take time to actually digest what's in it, um, what is the potential that it's going to push back the date of implementation for that act? Uh, you know, I wouldn't speculate on that. What I'd say is the implementation of 173 has been turned pushed back one year already. Yeah. I, I would not want to come down here um, and say I think that it could happen. I think that, um, well, you only need to read the executive summary of that report, the first 10 pages, to realize how um, significant it might be in terms of consequence. And if you consider, for example, the waiting study, and the potential policy levers associated with the waiting study and implications for communities, and school construction aid, which also has major implications, and a phenomenon of declining enrollment, right? And a phenomenon where some school districts recently unified are contending now, as, like you as a single board, looking at the population and grade configurations in particular schools serving rural communities, um, you know, I, for me, it can be summed up this way. Anything you do, don't go into lightly. And I think that speaks, speaks for itself. But sometimes there's a tendency for people to read a report and say, we need to act. And I think right now, um, paused reflection, considering where we are as a state in terms of the delivery of the public education system, um, that General Assembly would be well advised to do. And I say that with full recognition with, of the fact that there are going to be people who will say we need to adjust the weights, we need to adjust the weights, and maybe we do. Um, or maybe the General Assembly does. But it, it ought to take place with as big a field of view of all the implications. Um, you know, without belaboring the point, I'll just, this will be the last thing that I'll say because there's a lot of aspects to this that people need to think about. One of the things that I've heard legislators say is, well, what about communities that now have maybe some newfound uh, access to, to monetary capacity because of uh, increase in weights in certain categories, but then but decisions are made to um, not convert that into investment in the school systems but rather to save money on the taxation side. You know, that would be one real, that's something that people ought to think about. And what if you've got school districts that maybe have 
um, maybe are faced with declines in enrollment, and this is a real scenario, where they ought to be thinking about, for example, merging two schools into a single school, and they haven't done that. So, you know, how do you contend with a scenario where you might give them more capacity uh, when you would say, here's the capacity, but our recommendations would be that you invest it in a particular way? And is there any talk on the school construction aid um, about using it as a carrot to get districts that should be consolidating schools to do that? Hey, That's part of the conversation. Well, you build a new school, but it means that you're going to take these two. Yeah, sort of yeah, and you know, for me, what I observe in that conversation is, um, how does the saying go? Where you stand depends on where you sit. So that you know, there are still raw nerves over Act 46. And it would, be, you know, I'd, I'd, I would be the last person to sit in this chair and say that that's not true, because it is true. So the minute you start to talk about further inducements toward consolidation through some statewide policy lever, some people look at that apprehensively. I guess the point is, Vermont is challenged by demographics, socioeconomics, the overall economy, the fact that um, you know we've got an aging population and a low birth rate. Um, there, there are pressures on the budget, and Senator McDonald knows this. He's on the Finance Committee in the Senate. There are immense pressures, both in terms of where you get the money in order to put it into the programs that we have currently, and what happens every time every, somebody talks about an adjustment either to where they want to put that investment or how they're going to raise the money. It, you know, I, I, I would not want to overstate um, our circumstance, but there's a lot of concern at the General Assembly that is, I would say, at least it seems to be, to be quite a bit more complex and quite a bit more challenging than it might have been at other periods in the past. That's what I'd say. Um, so, so the waiting study is a big consideration. Um, something that wasn't really anticipated, and I don't know where it's going to go, um, is an emphasis on uh, examining the construct for proficiency-based education in Vermont. Um, the uh, revision to the school quality standards around 2012 to 2014 resulted in an emphasis on proficiency-based learning. Um, it contributed to the mindset that led to Act 77, which is so-called flexible pathways. Um, and um, this year, um, with when technically school districts are supposed to respond with a um, pro proficiency-based learning construct. Um, th the General Assembly and school officials started to hear about, you know, what does it mean for a high school transcript when you're in a proficiency-based learning system? This is not my area of expertise, but I am a fairly keen observer, and I know that all across the state, the notion of proficiency-based learning is being looked at differently from community to community. So some communities have responded that they don't think proficiency-based learning is a good idea. Other communities have said it's working well for us. It sort of focuses on the skills and abilities that we want each and every student to emerge from. Um, it's a very dynamic conversation without any focused piece of legislation the State Board of Education, um, which is, I would say, revisiting its own mission, um, decided that it would do a big meeting on proficiency-based learning, statewide meeting down in Rutland in January. They met from 1 o'clock to 9 o'clock at night. They had witnesses come through. Um, uh, now, this week and next, the Senate Education Committee is taking a lot of testimony on the subject, but there's no bill. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it is a... Uh, educational approach in Vermont that is being reviewed mm -hmm. and I think there's keen interest in it on the part of educators on the part of um, students and their families and on the part of the General Assembly I don't know what's going to happen with that but it's, it's added to the complexity um, I'm going to wrap up with just a few other categories um, there's a real interest in 
I would say, universality, right? So there's a bill on um, universal access to after school. There's a bill on universal um, provision of um, breakfast and lunch to every student at no cost to the student. Um, so there's a real interest in, uh, I would say, the equity mindset in utilizing schools to make sure that children receive access to um, education and what I would refer to, I guess, as components of education that stretch beyond classroom learning into things like after school, pre-K, um, nutrition, health, so on and so forth, all very important parts of the public education system, but there's an interest in um, addressing elements of the school system with a focus on universe, universal access. So that's, that's a phenomenon that I think the General Assembly is contending with because it all comes with a cost. So I frequently am asked by the media, what do I think about universal access, universal provision of meals? And what I say, no one's going to argue with nutrition. No one's going to argue with the utilization of local foods. Everybody believes that you ought to make it easy for kids um, at all grade levels to take advantage of good nutrition uh, programs that they get at schools um, in many instances. The meals that kids get in school are the best meals they get. Um, but, and there's always, you know, for me at least, there's always a but. You got to pay attention to the price tag. So the universal meal, meals legislation, I am told, and I think that this is under dispute, but the Joint Fiscal Office produced a report that said it had a price tag of, it, of about $50 million, right? That's $50 million in a state that already on a per pupil basis is in the top five of spending. And if you think back to what I said about school construction aid, we don't really provide school construction aid, right? So there are aspects to this that really require very close scrutiny. Uh, there, there are an array of other bills under consideration, um, but I will stop there because I've probably given you a lot to chew on. The legislators um, certainly will have comments that they want to add, but that I think is a pretty good medium level, not high, not in the weeds, but medium level view of what's going on in Vermont, in, in the Vermont State House right now. So. Thank you. Um, we'll have time for questions. Why don't we hear from Jay and Mark, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, How you doing? Uh, Jay Hooper, I represent five towns of Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury. I'm in my second term, and I serve on the House Education Committee. Um, there's pretty much nothing more that I could say that, that he hasn't covered, but um, I am curious to know uh, from this board and Jeff, uh, between the three universal bills, universal pre-K, universal school meals, and universal after school, which should be the priority for the Education Committee? Um, that's it. Anybody Universal pre-K for me? That's, that's what that's we've been what discussing doing in our own school district is the universal pre-K. Mm -hmm. That, I would think, would solve the most problems with it. With it. You know, that'd be the best investment, I would think. Anyone else? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Jay and I <clears throat> met this morning and wished we had met with Peter and said, um, and I want to welcome him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's jumped right in. But this is the first time we've come here with our own opinions, and, and this is a very sobering presentation by the superintendent. Um, and we thought, I'm going to ask how waiting affected Randolph, Brookfield, and Braintree. Um, Act 260, excuse me, Act 60 has been in place for 22 years. And the underpinnings are, as the superintendent said, they're based on spending per pupil. In the ensuing 22 years, which is a long time for state aid to education formulas, the, the construction part has, has not followed. And right now we're seeing towns with a lot of resources, whether it's South Burlington, 200 million bucks, they want an indoor track. and. Um, the, the more rural schools are in a very different situation. So 
the implications of what happens are as will be as, as profound as Act 60 was and will be as disruptive. And when you have new formulas that are, are being proposed to you know, the entire state, it's traditional to raise a bunch of money so that when the formulas change, you don't have a bunch of losers. And under the current budget proposal, as, the, as Jeff has pointed out, um, if you put your weighting, if you implement it, you have a whole bunch of towns that are going to be paying a lot more and a whole bunch of towns that are going to be paying a lot of less. A lot less. And um, I, for one, and, and my colleagues in the House, I think would be, would be very interested in seeing who's getting whacked and who isn't. I would add one other thing that's been happening in 22 years is the um, is the self-selection of towns, people moving to towns based on the on the schools. And 22 years ago, the towns that were wealthy um, were less wealthy than they are today. And 22 years ago, the towns, by just the demographics that are that struggle, are struggling more than they did 22 years ago. So that's going on, and. Um, this is the, is the biggest question for education, I think, in 22 years, and will rival um, the establishment of Act 60 22 years ago. And it ought to be taken. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to vote on this this year until I got a clear message from the school boards. And uh, I don't know if the school boards would feel competent to give a clear message this year until they had seen the various levels of changes that are being put forth. This is not a business as usual um, time. And I, I think Jeff has, has given a sobering analysis of, of what we have all, all of us have ahead of us. Do you have something to add here? Oh, all right. Well, first of all, I haven't had much to do with education yet. I've talked to Jay a little bit. I'm on the health care committee. Um, but I, I see a lot of parallels between what's happening in education and, and in health care between the rural and the, and the Burlington. Um, so it, it's, I, I'm hearing some things that, that make sense. Uh, the, the solutions are always pretty difficult, but I'm, uh, I'm here to listen, and I'm, I'm certainly very interested in education. I've got four kids. They all have been educators at one time or another. Uh, one of them is hung on. Uh, but uh, so I, I get a lot from them as well. So just looking forward to hearing more and, and being available. So. All right, so we've got about 20 minutes for questions or comments or insights. Um, do people in the audience or amongst the board have questions for Jeff or any of the legislators? We also had one question today after meeting with some teachers that invited, invited, us, invited us in and was uh, having the legislature accepted the governor's proposal to negotiate health care benefits at the statewide level. We've been through a year of that and we wanted to hear how this district has felt that that is, how successful has it been or would you, you wish there to be some modifications or whatever. That was a question we brought with us tonight. I don't know if you can give us an answer tonight, but yeah, that's I what think, we wanted to ask. I think it's um, it provided health care to a whole new category of um, faculty and employees than it ever did before in the district, which is always a good thing. Um, but at the same time, um, it came with a sticker shot to a district um, like us of 740,000 at a minimum. Um, could push one million and to have to adjust for that with little notice and, and little time is very difficult. Um, there were a lot of good works happening across the district that are going to be slowing down a bit um, until you know we can make those adjustments to, to accommodate that, that size of the bill. That's a huge bill um, for us. My biggest concern is that um, Again, it's, it's, I think it's wonderful that folks are, are getting, getting the health care that didn't previously have it. But more than likely, the districts that are going to be hit with the big bills are the ones that can least afford it. 
Um, in the bigger districts, they were already able to afford offering health care across all categories of employees. Um, so to them, you know, they're potentially looking at a savings with a new 80-20 split. Um, but for smaller districts that, that either weren't able or didn't offer that um, prior to, um, it's a big hit. And again, my guess is if we looked across the state, um, the districts that got hit the hardest were the ones that could least afford it. Um, just an opinion. And, Do you have any numbers on that? No, I mean, I, I, I thankfully, have, that's been between the employer um, commissioners, which the VSBA has supported, and the employee commissioners that the um, Vermont NEA has supported. In fact, the Superintendent's Association has 52 members, one of whom is Lane. We, we're represented in this negotiation by the employee commissioners, so there was a change there. Um, not because superintendents don't typically get um, the health insurance that is provided to other employees, but because superintendents often work w um, with the management side in the negotiation process. So that's been interesting. I think what I'm reminded of is something that you said about sort of a sobering presentation. Because if you take, let's say for example, and there's no right or wrong to this, it's just something that we need to contend with. If you had a district like this one that had um, a cost impact of 750,000 to a million dollars, and I think Lane's point was right. I mean, basically one emphasis of this negotiation or one result of the negotiation is to get uh, better coverage more affordably to the entire class of employees, right? So at least uniform. Yeah, yeah. So so you know I don't think it was a good thing or a bad thing or well intended or poorly intended, but the fact of the matter is there are school districts in Vermont where folks that were in certain categories of employee employment they had lesser coverage, right? So you make an adjustment of 750000 to a million to um, address that. And if you think back to what I said, and I'm not trying to be alarmist, you had facilities that needed school construction aid that you hadn't been able to generate. Because a lot of the um, issues around the condition of our facilities are because decisions have been made to put the money someplace else, right? So there, I have a report that shows that in Vermont, we've got among the higher spending in the country and, and one of the lesser investments in the last decade in terms of facilities. Um, so let's say that that was a factor or condition too. And you look at the results of the weighting study and all of a sudden your denominator is going to change because in the, in the weighting study, you're going to have fewer equalized pupils as a result. Now that's probably not a common circumstance or condition, although I don't know, because a lot of the places where the redistribution of weights uh, might benefit are more rural school systems, right? In the Northeast Kingdom, the superintendents in the Northeast Kingdom have a rural education collaborative and they have written a letter to the General Assembly saying it's now is the time to act. But when you get back to sort of the sobering effect, if you have to contend with all of those things, and let's say that you're dealing in a school system, which is not this one, where the unification process has brought you into a new dynamic. So you were in a supervisory union with seven school boards, each making decisions for a singular school, and now you're a single school board trying to contend with the challenges and needs of seven schools, that's probably a good organizational structure over time, but when you're faced with all these big things, it makes it hard to know what to do. To answer Mark's question directly, um, you know, I'm not sure how memory will record or history will record the um, elevation of healthcare bargaining to a statewide level, but it is a it's a dramatic adjustment in many places. And I would, you know, Lane's the first, the very first person I heard from. When the, when the decision was rendered by the arbitrator, within two days he called me and said, I want to tell you about what the cost impacts were here. 
So. Am I allowed to? Sure, of course. Yeah, this is well? an open <laughs> discussion here. Okay. Oh, I didn't know if it was open or not. So I, I, I wanted to comment on the, the, the number that Lane said. Um, as someone who was part of that process, um, when that, and I forget the exact amount that you, you had said it's going to cost the district. So, 750000 thank you. Um, those figures are based on an assumption that I think is a, a false assumption, and that um, that support staff is going to take health insurance at the same level that teachers currently take health insurance. And, um, and I don't believe that that's really going to happen for many reasons. Um, the, the cost is, is a primary one. Even though the, um, all tiers are going to be offered, now to support staff, um, if you look at what that is going to cost a, a person to, to buy that a higher level of coverage for, for example, a family plan, on their salary there are still a significant number of people who cannot afford it, who are going to be better off buying their health insurance through either their spouse or through the state um, health um, benefit program. So, um, I think it's a, it's a really big mistake to say that it's going to be at the same level that teachers take it. And I forget the percentage of teachers that take a you know, family plan, for example. And, and it, but I know it's, it's hot. Um, and and I just, there's no way I think it's going to be at that same level for support staff to, to take that. And, and I do agree. I think it was of the utmost importance um, that People have access, though, to all those tiers. And, and yes, it's huge um, difference, and, and there will be some cost to it, but it's an important cost, but not as high a cost as I think is being put out there. The, the other thing I wanted to say that in, in our particular district, um, for professional staff, it's a huge increase um, to for health insurance. We're going from, um, in one year, 50, paying 15% of our health um, care um, for the premiums to 20%. And a 5% increase um, alone is going to cost over $1,000, um, closer to $1,500 um, for a family plan. And, and that's a significant chunk of change um, to, to put out. I, I think there needs to be, at the statewide level, a, a bigger discussion as well of how to make health care uh, affordable for all people in the state, that, it, that it's, it's a burden that gets bigger and bigger and bigger when you're putting it on public institutions and, and private employers. And, and that, I think, does need to be addressed at a statewide level, and that we should be working towards having all people having access um, to high quality health care, like which they don't have. Add a little on to the, the last part of, of what Nora said, which I think is important. In all other industries, um, if you want to increase your market share, you either have to build a better product or have better customer service or both. Health insurance is the one industry where that is not the case. Um, they want to increase their market share year after year. The cost of actually providing the health services don't really go up anywhere near as much as what the insurance companies are charging, and we're seeing an average 14% increase every year. That's the problem. They don't have to provide better service. They don't have to provide um, better quality of, uh, of what they do provide, but yet they're still able to just jack up the prices year after year um, without providing anything different for it um, to meet their desires in terms of their business model. Um, and I think that's a problem. Um, so, but, yeah. Yeah, if I get some payback on what you're saying, I, mean, I agree 100%. I, I think. Um, you know, I think everyone sitting back here is in this kind of dual position of having a lot of sympathy for where y'all are sitting because we all pay taxes, right? And we, you know, we're all taxpayers and getting hit there. And our health insurance costs are going up and that, you know, that hurts on both sides. So, I mean, I think just to, to really echo and to, to, to put a little bit of a, uh, a more pointed question maybe to some of the legislators because I think that, um, yeah, this issue of runaway health care costs is, is huge. And I, I don't have the data on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone in this room does. Like, how, 
how much of the rising cost of education and the shrinking pie that we're talking about how to carve up and still have equity is getting eaten up by the health insurance industry. Um, I think it's going up quite a bit faster than anybody's wages, anybody, you know, it, it's, a, it's a huge problem. I think we can definitely all agree. And um, I'm not an expert in this, but as far as I can tell, it seems like the only game in town for addressing this right now is, is One Care, which is a so-called accountable care organization. But as some of you may have read, you know, our union, along with the State Employees Union, declined to enter that because the accountability seemed like it wasn't a two-way street. You know, like they, it's, it's kind of a, a black box. And so I'm just wondering, like, are there other options? Are there things that, that folks are talking about? And, and do, do you, as, as representatives, think that it's appropriate for you know, the, the towns to be footing the bill for these rising health care costs out of the education budget? Because what it seems to me is like we're having to make really tough decisions about what's important because there's not another option besides having this for-profit company, you know, take a, enormous sums of money and, and promise us that they're going to be able to lower costs. But I, the only, you know, the, the one thing I would add is I know that, you know, in the governor's budget proposal, they're asking for $6 million to plug a hole in their budget out of Medicaid funds, which is disturbing as someone who teaches many, many um, students who, who use access Medicaid and knowing that the existing, you know, there's still problems with access under the existing system. So, um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious because, you know, I think I appreciate what you're saying. Um, well, I'll comment a little bit us. on one care. I, I can't claim to be a total expert, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a complicated entity. Um, and there's been, I don't think anybody really understands it well, other than maybe the people that run one care and maybe a few people in health policy. But the whole concept is to try to, um, I guess, gather as many people who are covered by insurance under one umbrella so that, that you have a little more clout in negotiating and, and structuring and directing money to things that are, uh, I guess, geared towards improving people's health rather than um, having them end up going to very expensive care. That's the concept. It, uh, I'm not saying it, it's working yet, but it's uh, we're kind of in the early stages. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the One Care budget and whether it's appropriate or not. I mean, ranging from their budget went up 56% this year, which is true technically, but it's because a lot more people are underneath that, so it doesn't mean that health care costs went up 56%. Um, but One Care does have a, a cost to running it and transforming the healthcare system from something where you're getting a, a fee for service every time you perform something as a doctor to one that I think the state is trying to lean towards where hospitals are given X amount per person in their coverage area and they have to deal with their health for better or for worse, which is supposed to incentivize them to provide more of the front end healthcare rather than the expensive back end. Um, that's the theory, again, doesn't always work perfectly. So to, to make that transformation, there was some investment required in, in some systems and processes within One Care uh, that I think is that $6 million number that um, you were talking about, which is kind of up in the air whether all of that is going to come through. Uh, as far as I can tell, One Care itself costs about $4 million to actually run administratively. Uh, and the other issue with it is that it's it's technically a for-profit company. It it really doesn't exist to make profit, so it, it really runs more like a nonprofit. I think there's some reasons that it can't become technically a nonprofit, but there there are some initiatives to try to basically make them follow all the nonprofit rules and have a little more transparency about their their costs, which hasn't happened yet. But I, that's kind of the direction that I hope we're heading. Um, the other piece is the Green Mountain Care Board, which is supposed to kind of keep a, a cap on costs overall. And I think they've done an okay job at, at forcing those, those cost controls down to the, at least the hospitals and, and some of the providers that are under their, their administration. But they only have a, a limited purview of, of health care. So they, they cover the hospitals, but um, that's, that's not the whole picture. So th there's nothing that's forcing cost down in a dramatic way, unfortunately, other than a couple things. So we're looking at a sort of pharmaceutical costs and prescription costs um, 
the concept of importing drugs from Canada is one thing that's been floating around out there. Um, seems like no one's actually talked to Canada about this, so I'm not sure it's going to be something that happens real fast. Uh, but Do we talk to them? <laughs> no, we're trying. Uh, so there, there, there is some pressure being brought to bear in certain drugs like insulin and a couple other specialized things, but um, again, it's been a little bit here and there, not, not a, a broad thing that's going to you know, drop your health care costs. <coughs> but, yeah, the insurance rate's going up 12, 14 percent when everything else in healthcare is going up 3%. I, I don't understand why that's happening yet, but I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, you think the, kind of the last piece to, to kind of add on, I'm, I'm pretty confident in the, in the 7, 740 number. Uh, we did a lot of research. Maybe wrong, we'll, we can compare notes in a year or two once it's fully implemented. Um, but I, I want people not to forget compound interest. I now potentially have another 750,000, 740,000, a million dollars that every year when insurance goes up by 14%, which has been about the average the last couple of years, that I've got to pay another 14% on top of. Um, so it is actually accelerating the, the tax increase in the town um, by adding. Again, that's looking at it strictly from a business perspective, leaving the people out of it. But to, to bring in another piece of what Nora said in terms of um, the, 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 the workers, um, in some cases, not being able to afford it, one of the things going into the statewide negotiations that might be of value is, you know, taking a look at salary thresholds and what the percentages are. You know, if you make a low salary and, you know, you're entitled to health insurance, maybe you're not paying 80-20, maybe you're paying 80-15. And those that are above this dollar amount, maybe you're paying, you know, so what, 17 and maybe, yeah. Income sensitivity was a really big item that was on the table. Um, and, and being looked at and to try to figure out a model and we had some models for how to do income sensitivity which is what you're talking about I, I supported a hundred percent I think it, it should happen um, because you're right why should someone who has a hundred thousand uh, dollar a year salary be paying the same amount as someone who has you know a sixteen thousand dollar a year salary um, it's not equitable um, there were a lot of, there were some legal issues in how the law was written that um, prevented it, and, um, and then there was a, a time issue. Um, but I think it is something that does absolutely need to be looked at and, and, and happen. But that, that's a suggestion. If, if the goal of the, the committee is, is equality, which it seems like, I mean, that was the result of it, which isn't a bad thing. Um, just thoughts. Any other questions? Is it um, yeah. yeah. Mine's not necessarily healthcare related. Yeah, so that's fine, but it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, to finish the healthcare, um, we, we have somebody in our family who's on the support staff. My name's Dave Wood, uh, for the school, and so I see the numbers from both perspectives. And uh, if it's if it's broad and like it will be offered, if we were offered a family coverage, it'd be a no-brainer for us to take it. We would save hundreds of dollars a month, probably compared to what I pay my employer. So I, I'd be surprised if most people didn't take it. But So I would definitely support the income sensitivity program. And so I'd encourage Jay and others to try to bring that up again, and try to rehash it. Um, to change the subject, I have a question about the proficiency-based grading. Um, I was following it more closely a couple years ago when we were implementing it here. And I was told it was mandatory and required statewide. And I heard Jeff say, sort of. And I've been just anecdotally asking other parents and other communities, and I've had more than one say, no, we started to implement it, we didn't like it, and we stopped. And I said, well, I thought it was state, it required statewide. And one of them said they're just doing it kind of on the side, and they're keeping with the normal A's, B's, 90's, 80's, and, they're, and that's what they're really using on their transcripts. And I had somebody else say they just, they're not doing it at all. So I stopped following it at the state level, so I guess my question is, how mandatory is it, and should we be considering dropping it as well? So there's there's a there's a loophole in the law. Um, in, in well, there, there's no law. That's the thing, right? So the, it's, the act is, it's based yeah. on the rule rules that were put into place by the state board as a result of the education quality standards work. Yeah. But your question's a good one, and I and I when I query people about it, I hear what you heard. So I talked to a superintendent today. And I said, you know, they're taking a hard look at proficiency-based learning. And the response was, educationally, it's supported 
for how it supports kids in terms of their aptitudes, their aspirations, how they learn what they need to know. But the grading aspect of it and how it translates to a transcript is inconsistently applied across across Vermont. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it may be that the result of the legislative process will bring some clarity to it. Um, uh, I was, you know, so I didn't mean to cut you oh, off. No, man, but it's it, a reg, reg's a reg. I mean, it's the, the Secretary of Education could have quite a bit of weight to say if we weren't following through on it. Um, but there, there is a loophole in it, and it was one of the things that, that I brought up um, my first year here, and the loophole would work something like this, is, yeah, we've got to have the graduation proficiencies, but we could state them in such a way as, yeah, these are our graduation proficiencies, and you've met this one if you've got a, a, a earned a grade of a B or higher in Algebra 2 and, and um, you know, Algebra 1. So they could have been met that way, which my guess is what some districts have chosen to do. Um, there is a lot of good that can come out of uh, proficiency-based grading. I am not a supporter of it. Um, I keep my mouth shut kind of on it because the, the Superintendents Association is, is very strong about it. I'm, I'm more kind of neutral. Um, it has great potential if done right, um, but the way that it happened in the state was that every district ran off and had to kind of do their own creation because there was no model um, that anyone had kind of proposed as this is what it could look like or what it could do. Um, and so how it's kind of worked out here, and some of the teachers can probably speak up that, that, that use this and disagree with me if, 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 if they like, um, is that it's an enormous amount of effort tracking, putting the little check boxes and the marks inside the, the system for a small amount of benefit. I, so I can tell you This not, much effort. It, has, it hasn't been extremely easy for parents and kids to follow yeah. what it means to be, say, um, you know, college track versus not, honors versus not. This is not, I think a lot of teachers are doing good work and when you ask the questions, but it, it takes the parents asking a couple of times, each teacher does it a little bit differently. And so I guess I would encourage the legislators to pass a bill that makes it clear that every school either has to make it part of their transcript or not, because you need strength in numbers for the college admissions to really take it seriously or not. You don't want to have a one-off school doing it when everybody else is getting away with not. And, and, a, and a model so that it's consistent, because um, everybody is doing it different. There was no model to follow. Um, coming from Massachusetts, they put in standards-based grades a decade ago. Um, they didn't do it at the high school level. Uh, they did it at the, the elementary and the middle school level. It was never going to fly in Massachusetts at the high school level. But it is incredibly powerful um, at the elementary and the middle school. Um, in terms of w what it does and helping the teachers really, you know, whittle down to where individual kids are struggling and helping them. So, yeah. So just thoughts. Our time is about up. Do other people have, do you have another question have, or comment? Um, yes. Another, I, I would love for, um, maybe it's Jay, to um, tell us a little bit more about the, the literacy focus. Sure. Um, so we've got a couple different bills. There are three different literacy bills um, in committee. Um, we're sort of focusing on the chair's version of it. Um, but the bill would basically require um, teachers to, to learn how to screen students in first grade and kindergarten for dyslexia. Um, and there's, there's difficulty on that topic because there's a lack of consensus as to the definition of dyslexia. Um, <clears throat> we had a public hearing the other day um, on this bill and it was very surprising that 28 people said you should pass a bill endorsing structured literacy uh, and just one person uh, advocated for the alternative which I think is the status quo, uh, that's my understanding, which is balanced literacy. Um, so I, I think that the, the conversation is in its infancy. There's a lot more testimony to be taken. Um, and what I told the Randolph Union High School teachers this afternoon uh, was that the conversation isn't slowing down right now, but it's calming down. Um, we're realizing that not taking action on a bill is an option. Um, and maybe the, the most prudent. I, I guess I would just ask for Ask caution because I think anytime the state tries to legislate, 
we create a whole bunch of new issues. Exactly, <laughs> and, and I think this is ripe for that in yeah. so many ways. And I, I don't want to take up more time to no, right. talk privately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, we should talk <laughs> offline, but um, I think the chair, Kate Webb, she, I think she was the one who led the charge, um, sort of this urgency that we have to solve this, this problem because 32% of students going into fifth grade are not proficient readers, they're reading at a first grade level. And to assume that that's because, you know, three out of ten students are dyslexic, I think is um, not realistic. I think we've got a whole bunch of different issues, you know, students are hungry, uh, they're tired, you know, maybe there's issues at home, um, you know, there are other factors. So I think we're talking about maybe studying <coughs> the different determinants of those uh, problems. Universal pre-K may hit a lot yeah. of what you're concerned about. Yeah. yeah the, the one piece, because I, I tend to dwell on impacts, and um, but I do all the legislation, even the ones that I've, I've harped on a little bit, they all came from a, a point of view of people putting in things to make things better. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do see that. Um, so I do, I do want to make that statement. Um, good news. I think uh, we're going to pass a tax and regulate cannabis bill, which will create some revenue for some of these programs. I, I think the governor will advocate for uh, that money to go towards an after school program, um, but I think it's possible that we could massage that into a different place. But um, there was question of, I think the, the tax committees were trying to suggest that this the sales tax, I think they tried to rename it a retail tax in order to be allowed to divert that money to a different place. Um, that has been nipped in the butt. So I think that money will go towards the Ed Fund uh, one way or another, which is good. It was like a 20% tax, too, wasn't it? I think that's pretty high. It is pretty high, yeah. yeah. So. Any other questions or comments for our legislators before they go? very much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to say it. Should I? You certainly you don't have to. <laughs> you don't actually have to go anywhere. <laughs> I mean, what else do you have to do? Oh. Maybe <laughs> sleep. Don't be strangers, though. Anybody wants to testify on anything, give me a call. Okay. Um, is are one of us willing to be an evaluator for this meeting? <laughs> Thank you, Ann. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, right. So we need. I'm starting to start to be a dictator here, Rachel. So watch. I don't believe in evaluations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to make icons. Did you? Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on to. The, uh, follow up with the bus route um, issue. Um, the, the materials were available for anyone to look at in the OSSD office. Um, so I would like to hear what um, you know. Someone lead off the discussion with what you think we, what action you think we ought to take as far as um, Cat's bus route question. I have kind of two viewpoints on this. One is. That my understanding after the discussion is that the the bus routes are made to serve the greatest good, and they can't collect every student at every home. Um, so that's my that's one viewpoint. And then the other thing I think is that we've clearly we've clearly identified this as something that our superintendent has the final say on. Does anyone have something different to say or add? Well, I'll add just that I went, I went in and I looked over the, the, com the email conversations. It doesn't seem that, you know, I think everything was handled professionally. 
the person was responded to appropriately and it was looked into, it was checked into with the select board. And so, I, I mean, really, he's making that final decision with the input of the transportation director who is really the one who knows the routes and the, what the buses can handle. And the decision was made that it was not, it was not an appropriate stop. So I think they've done due diligence, they've responded as, as appropriately, and it's unfortunate, but that's, you know, we can't, we can't bus everybody to their doorstep. And that's just the way it Does goes. anyone else have anything else to add or something different to say or an additional comment? No. Anyone have a disagreeing point of view on this? No. Is someone willing to make a motion um, to resolve I make this? a motion in supporting Lane's decision on not um, changing the bus route. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of um, supporting Lane's policy as stated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you for everyone's um, look at those emails and the correspondence. That's helpful. All right, um, so we have s uh, upcoming meetings um, in, in preparation for our, our both our budget and the vote on town meeting day. There's a budget informational meeting um, in the media center here. Um, was there um, the public comment section? That was the agenda? that was the legislators. Did you want something else? I did. <laughs> let's, let's finish the this. Thank topic you. And then we can go. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's a budget informational meeting. Uh, when next? Next Wednesday? Mm -hmm. No, two yeah, weeks. Six, two weeks. Yeah, the 26th here at the media center. Um, and then the, the annual meeting takes place the day before town meeting. That's Monday at 6 p.m. in the media center this year. Um, please try to come to that. Um, it's important that we have as many school board members as possible. Um, there will be townspeople, should be some townspeople asking questions. We will do a vote um, on the treasurer and uh, that sort of thing um, at that meeting. And then of course, the budget vote takes place at town meetings in our various towns. Um, all right. Public comment. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I wanted to, and, and it might be too late um, in, in essence, but I wanted to make some comments about um, concerns that I have on the reduction of Paris in, in the budget that's being proposed. Um, I, I first want to say I, I really do appreciate the model that I think Lane is, is, is putting forward at, at, to change to have it be a, a one to three ratio of, of um, one special educator for three classrooms, I think that that could have a huge positive impact um, for our students. Having said that, the, the cost of that, I think, might negate the, the, the positive impact that it can have. And by cost, I mean it's going to cost a, a huge reduction in, in um, para-educator support. And, and that really concerns me as a classroom teacher. Uh, the the paraeducators that we currently have are in place primarily as one-to-one -one supports for students with high needs. And, um, and while I agree that we don't want that in the long run, we want students to be independent, we want to work towards students being independent, and I think it's, um, I, I've heard that it's being looked at to have as part of um, regular meetings to have a process to look to see and have to have goals in students' IEPs towards them gaining independence, which I think is really important. Um, but there are, the reality is, is there are students that need those one-to-ones, either because um, their needs are not, are, are so high that they're not going to be able to be independent. And I'm talking about severely autistic students. Um, or students who have had um, trauma to, to a degree that, that it's had a huge impact on them, 
or students who are um, intellectually impaired, developmentally impaired, who um, we have to be realistic, are, are going to need that kind of support through life. Um, and, and we have the job of educating them. Um, and, and I think that's an important job and, and a job that we need to take very seriously and we need to do it to the best means possible. And for many of those students, it means having that one-to-one -one para support. And in order, that's a team decision. It's not a decision that's ever made lightly. Um, it's always made looking at how, is this really necessary? Is there any other way we can give the student have their needs be met? And it's, it's really a last resort um, for these students. And, and I'm very concerned that this is going to take away those supports that these students need. It's also a legal um, issue because it's a team decision. It's in students' IEPs. It has to be provided. It has to be a team decision to remove that support from them. And, um, and you cannot say, we can to remove it because we don't have the money. Um, you have to find the money if the team decides that they need that. So where is the money going to come from? So it's going to have a, a negative impact on the other students in our district as well. Um, so, so thank you. <laughs> Do you want to respond from a budget standpoint? or? Um, I can, but we've kind of, I think at the last meeting I said my piece. So okay. I'm happy that they should have an opportunity to be able to. Can I just ask a yeah. question? Yeah. Sure. No uh, questions. Nora, you, you know what his plan is, is uh, with the, so based on what you've heard his plan is and your concerns, what would you recommend? I, I think having a close look at, at you know, um, and I think we're doing that, as, as I know in, in our school we're doing that, a close look on, on are there students that, that have para support right now that really don't need it, that can be um, worked towards being more independent. And, and I, can, I, don't, I don't, it's not appropriate for me to name names, but I know of two such situations where they're saying, this, these students really have gained enough independence that they don't need these paras. Um, and I think it's perfectly appropriate for that, those para, that para support to be removed. Um, I think, though, that you can't depend on that. You could have a student move in who has those high needs again. It, it's, so I'm not saying, I think there has to be some flexibility in the budget. <laughs> because I think you, you have those unexpected situations and you have other situations where um, it, that independence is not yet there for those kids. Thank you. Thank you. I think putting more money in, into the budget, as hard as that is, is I guess what I would say is needed. Did you have a comment? Well, yeah, um, before Elaine's time, about five years ago in the high school, we decided to cut a significant amount of paraeducators and hire special educators to replace them. And um, within two years, we were scrambling around. We didn't have enough adult support system to work with the kids that the, the kids that needed them the most. And um, the special educators were running thin and. Um, Honestly, uh, from a legal standpoint, we weren't doing the best that we could do um, to support those students. And by hearing the cuts and thinking about it and processing it and already being gone through it within the high school, it does scare me. Because um, I see the needs rising among special education students and the students that need support, especially um, with the trauma and with emotional disturbance. And um, for once, I feel like I will say that since Lane has been here, he has been providing what we need um, from the uh, aspect of having enough paraeducators, enough special educators, and um, now we have um, like the social worker in the building, which has been a tremendous help and we still need more and it's not because we're not doing our jobs it's because we are seeing a rise with students that need this um, and so just to hear the words cut again I just I think back that we should look um, of what has already happened when we have cut paraeducators I mean just in my room I was in the intensive needs and I started out with seven paraeducators and I ended when I left that room with two 
um, it just didn't work. So I think there has to be a lot of data around around that. Yeah, the only the only piece I'm, I want to add is just so people um, aren't confused, there are no cuts monetarily. Matter of fact, it's a nine percent increase to the special education budget for next year. What is happening is we are transitioning some paras out and using that money to buy additional special educators because the special educators are the ones that can provide the services to the students to provide the independence that they need. Um, in any case where a student who moves into the district, there is money available because there will always be students that need one-to-ones. Um, so that's already been accounted for in the, in the, in the budget process. Um, in fact, uh, the number of paras that were put as kind of a general level in most models in most districts, they don't exist. It's just the teachers. Um, I recognize that we are transitioning away from a model that is not working um, right now, hopefully to one that will. Um, and so I've made sure that there are additional supports, which, which is why there's a 9% increase to the, the special education budget next year um, to help with that transition. Again, it's not, there is no cut in terms of finances. I'm not cutting back. It has nothing to do with money. It has to do with providing better for services to students. Um, right now, the, the special educators at the elementary schools, because I've looked at all of their schedules, um, at best, they're spending 15 minutes providing services to their students. You cannot change anything in 15 minutes um, of services, and so that's the hope. I understand the human part of it. Um, it's not pleasant, it's not nice, um, but the focus is the student. Um, and right now, at least in, in terms of the analysis, um, we're not providing what we need. Nothing to do with the fact that the, the services in, in so fact is what they are are not valuable or important. They did. They, they helped us manage the system uh, and, and, and keep it running. Um, but they're not helping us get, get us um, to where we need. Um, so that, that cut piece I just want to be careful with. That's well, I, I guess I, I would just like to add, because I know we're running out of time. Um, and, and as I said, I'm not sure that is something that the board can really um, change. But I know that when you don't have that pair of support for some of those students that, that need it, um, what ends up happening is that the special educator um, does the job of the pair educator in that they are managing behaviors um, instead of providing the special ed services that are so badly needed. They're not teaching children um, at that point. Um, and, and again, I, I'm concerned that with this, this switch um, of, and, and reallocation, that that's going to become worse, not better. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So we have one other thing, which if, okay. if it's all right. <laughs> so I was approached by a um, teacher at Brookfield <coughs> recently with some concerns about what's happening in our little schools Brookfield and Braintree since we've gone from not having a full-time principal. And it's been something that's been yeah. problematic for a while now. But this was a particularly rough day for this teacher last week or the week before. There's many, many days where there is not a principal or a guidance person in the buildings for us. A lot of days we deal with that and we and we can manage. Um, there's a lot of us and I know personally at, at Braintree we're very flexible and we try to pitch in when we can but it's a big concern to not have somebody that's there <coughs> always. It puts a big stress on our admin assistants who are generally the first one to be called to um, if there's a need with a student, especially as a behavior issue. Um, we also don't have a full-time nurse. That doesn't tend to be the bigger issue as it is behavior issues with students. Um, it's just something that I felt, um, Nora and I had talked about it and thought this would be the best place to just bring it up. Just so you're aware of the situation, um, I feel very strongly that in both of our schools, there has to be either a guidance person or a principal every day in our buildings. 
um, there's just concerns that something major could happen and to put that on the rest of us that's there that are already were taken from our jobs to take care of that when it should be somebody that it's more on, on their responsibility. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's something we'll, we'll discuss. Thank you. Deb, did you have your hand up no, too? I was <laughs> just trying to get oh, your attention. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You're right enough, I mean, so Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, thanks very much um, for your comments and your concerns and your suggestions and things like that. Um, it's really helpful for us to have people come to these meetings so that we can you know, broaden our knowledge of what's going on in the schools. So we, we do appreciate it. All right. Um, negotiations with unions, board management, governance. So we've been through uh, first round uh, with both support staff and with the, the teachers. Uh, first round pretty much consisted of an exchange of proposals. There was no rationale or justification for what the proposals were that comes um, in the, the next round. Um, that is happening. The meetings are open. Um, folks are able to, welcome to attend um, as part of it. I can give a, a brief description of what the exchanges were, but it is in the superintendent's report. That right. Um, so, you know, it's hope, hopeful, you know, the goal is at, at least from um, my side and the board side, hopefully, is, you know, finding what's fair for the, the staff. Um, what's going to help kind of advance the ends in terms of the students and still be palatable to the taxpayer. Um, so it's three three things that we're trying to accomplish, um, um, which isn't always easy. But our, our hope is, is that it goes through. So. Do we have more meetings this month or? Uh, the, so actually, yeah. next week. Yeah. Okay, the, the teachers, yeah. I think we the have next fifth, week. I believe. Yeah. Oh, no, That's for the support staff. Support staff. Yeah. Yeah, I think next Wednesday we have a meeting. Oh, you did? Yeah. What I'll do is I'll email that around so that everybody has what they are. 19th. 19th, Okay, so come on up. Same as the forum night. All right. The board member orientation discussion was something that we started, I believe, last time in the policy governance training, just sort of discussing what it is that. Uh, new board members need to know and, and how that time ought to be structured. Um, I'm particularly interested in hearing from the newer board members of, you know, what what would you like from, um, or would you have liked to have had sort of as an introduction to the way this board runs? Well, I did the training in Montpelier. Is that where I was in the training mm -hmm. there too? And that was really helpful. I think it that was, was really a good start. And I don't know how often they offer those. Um, and then... I think I, I entered at a, a really awkward time, but yes. generally, we, <laughs> so I'm gonna put it. Um, but it's been generally when we started moving on to having regular, maybe you know, trainings at the end. I started to get more understanding of of what it was, rather than just sitting and reading through a manual. Mm -hmm. It helped to go through those exercises, and, and it really was useful to talk that out. So I would I would say to do more of those, or at least okay. include those, mm -hmm. um, maybe special with just new board members who have been here for less than X amount of time should have their own like separate meeting that's too much you yeah. know, for everyone to get together. Okay. Did you have the same mm -hmm. experience? Mm -hmm. Anything else that you would want to suggest? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I guess both Brian and Ashley came in sort of at the same you know, or also recent, or even. Yeah, I mean, I think I might have been a little bit different because I would have been coming to the meetings for over a year, and I <laughs> right. did a lot of research about policy governance on my own. Yep. Yeah. So you know, when I started, I kind of had a head start on my own of, of it, so I was able to follow along pretty easily. Mm-hmm. So. So anything more or different suggestion you would have to? I would talk definitely about? think if, if someone wasn't, you know had at least the knowledge of it, they would, something would be real handy, to maybe mm -hmm. a class or something. Yeah, the to, training was useful. And yeah. also meeting with other people from different boards was helpful mm -hmm. in getting that different perspective. Yeah, I thought that VSPA training was well done. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So maybe we should sort of make 
sure that people do attend those. Yeah, because the uh, governance policy is brand new from where mm -hmm. I come from, so it was eye-opening. Um, I did, I would certainly take advantage of training if there was something along mm -hmm. those lines. I found that our meeting that we had um, a couple months back, I can't remember now, um, with mm -hmm. Sue. Yep. 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 Oh yeah, the, the uh, facilitator that came, you mean? Yes. Yeah. I actually found that to be very helpful because I think coming into this and trying to navigate what our responsibilities are, but really um, to understand that communication with the community, with staff, you know, the expectation of Lane. Those are the types of things um, that would be helpful for me to understand what those boundaries are mm -hmm. and expectations, truly. And, and especially with, I think you and I are in the same boat with a with a student right in the mm -hmm. middle of the school system. Yeah, right. that it's that what I found was the most difficult is mm -hmm. the switching the hats between the a parent and a board mm -hmm. member. Yeah, that is challenging. Mm -hmm. But it's really important, I think, to have people with kids on this board. Absolutely. And people who have children who are already out of the system. So don't get any ideas about, <laughs> don't get any ideas about leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any other ideas as far as onboarding um, new members? For policy governance, we used to send them to everybody to Atlanta. They don't yeah. offer that they anymore. Offer that anymore. No. Did they offer the one in Canada? Or was it Canada? No. Or now you ha you can do an online. Whatever. That's all they have now is the online. Wow. It's quite that was really too. helpful. Yeah, the Atlanta. That was, Atlanta was really it was helpful. Very helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, it was in October. It was lovely. Yeah. Well, Sue, Sue would probably do yeah. something. Yeah. Um, she would come down. Okay. I think one of the things when I was a new board member, that was a long time ago, after the first couple years, I ended up um, joining the VSBA board. So that really was interesting. That broadened my perspectives on what's going on in the state and connecting with other board members. And I think if you ever feel the need, the, you have the time and the ability to do that, that's good for anybody <coughs> to do. I think it really was helpful um, just to see others, what the struggles are around the state and kind of appreciate what's going on here and, you know, being able to talk about policy governance with people who may not even be in policy governance, it really helps focus on how we're living it, too. So that's the state. V VSEBA yeah, board, yeah. Right, right. It's the state board, uh, school board association, yeah. and so they meet. Um, Every month. All righty. Um, thank you. And, you know, I guess you're running, so maybe you'll be the beneficiary of some <laughs> excellent <laughs> orientation. It's fine. <laughs> Um, next, we have two uh, EL reports that are new, so that we will read them this month and uh, vote on them next month. Can you yeah, give have us anything some, to add? They're, um, they're both on kind of the financial financials, which makes sense because we're just kind of wrapping up at least the board's person portion of the budget um, season, but uh, EL 2.3 is financial conditions and activities, um, really kind of focuses on making sure that we're paying the bills on time, um, collecting monies that are owed to us um, in a timely fashion, and that we're actually sticking to the budget that, that was set forth and that the budget was created around um, supporting the board's ends. Um, nothing to report, um, all is in compliance in terms of EL 2.3. Um, executive limitations 2.6 is on asset protection. Um, it's making sure we're protecting our assets, both the money but uh, the facilities as well. Um, you know, making sure that we're doing proper maintenance, um, that we're carrying the proper amount of insurance um, to cover us in case there's liability. Um, and then lastly, ensuring that the, the processes and the procedures that we have in place all have dual control. It's got more, always more than one person looking at it. Okay. Um, and so um, at this point in time, um, that's in compliance as well. Um, the biggest thing, I mean, there was a budget impact to try to make sure that it stayed in compliance. And that was the 32000 um, and the, the groundskeeper that we mm -hmm. added to the budget this year. The 32000 was to make sure that um, we were actually 
providing facilities with what they need and what they're actually spending on basic things like supplies um, and whatnot. And then the groundskeeper um, is needed so that they do not have to keep pulling custodial staff um, to actually do that work. Um, the, the schools are hurting a little bit this year because of that need. Um. So board members, please read these reports over before our March meeting and please go into the OSSD office and look at those binders with um, all the backup information that will support his um, his reports there, his monitoring reports. That would be great. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, um, we have the minutes from our last meeting. Um, if people would look at them over, see if there's anything we need to add or subtract or change. Um, we need to approve signers for tentative agree agreements. What is that, uh, Linda? Um, Oops, sorry about that. So the confidential master agreement? No, signer no, for tentative no, agreements. That. What does that I was, mean? I was reading ahead to check my notes. Um, signers for tentative agreements. So while we are sitting in negotiations um, oh, yeah. with both the support staff and with the, <laughs> the, the teachers, um, there will be times where we agree on language. At that point in time, it's required that people that have the authority to do so can actually sign off on the wording right then and there so that it's, it's locked into place. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we need is we need the board to, to vote in um, signers for that. Um, uh, the recommendation is Pietro, and if he's not there, me. Um, and again, if there are tentative agreements. Um, there's nothing that's permanently locked in. Everything still has to come back to the full board for a vote. Um, before it's, it's finally approved, uh, but it just helps the process along and adds, adds legitimacy to it. Does anyone have questions about this? Concerns? So you would propose having Pietro with you as a backup? Yeah, and just, uh, you know, Pietro had a, a massive conflict on the, the support staff night, so I, I was there. So that's the only reason you even have me on there. I see. I'm usually just a recommending person. Um, the board is the one that really has the authority to agree. But. So you guys on these negotiation boards, is there any, do you have any concerns about this? No, uh, whenever we have the negotiation, Petro and Lane always ask us for our tentative approval. And it, all it is is Petro is usually our point person, so he's the one that always talks. So it'd be odd for, say, me or Brian to then sign. Because okay. the whole time we would just be sitting there silently and then all of a sudden we sign, which is what we did on our last meeting because uh, we didn't have anybody, so I was the uh, vice chair, so they said, okay, well, you, you sign since we have no agreement. So okay. I mm -hmm. think the agreement with Petro doing it is, makes the most sense. Yeah, and he, he understands the language the best. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so is that just a, a vote that we need to take, or do we need no, to sign off on giving him that? Uh, no, just a vote as part of the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, um, but you're delegating authority. Okay. Um, hopefully we can approve these all um, together, but perhaps we need a spe special vote for this. Reserve funds for the driver's ed car. So the driver's ed car a few weeks back um, was rear-ended in Montpelier. Oh. Um, was not the fault of our driver. Um, is it a student driver? Uh, poor student driver. Oh, but they oh, got to learn did. how to fill out the forms. Oh. And the process oh. and the um, so the car ended up being totaled. It was a 2011 Camry. Um, what we need right now is we've got students that are in driver's ed that do not have a car to drive to get their house. Okay. So um, surprisingly, that 2011 Toyota Camry was worth $9,800. What? Um, so that money will be applied towards the purchase of the new. Um, but how this is worded, um, what we need to do is try to draw from the transportation um, reserve fund. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to get all the money for the car up front so that we can like purchase it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we will do is when that $9,800 check comes in, um, from the insurance company, we put it right back in the reserve fund okay. if the board is willing. That makes um, a lot so of sense. So there is an outline of the costs and whatnot on the, on the, the sheet there. Um, he's looking for a RAV4 um, as opposed to a car because um, SUVs are typically what people drive now. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece um, that's new uh, in the curriculum is that they have to be familiar with all the gadgets. 
um, especially the anti-collision devices and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get a car that has those on it so the kids are familiar with it. <laughs> it's new, it's from the state contract, so it doesn't have to go out to bed. Okay. So what's the state contract? Uh, the state negotiates with certain vendors around um, for the best price. Um, and when that happens, we don't have to go out to bid when the cost is over 15000 because they're already know, right? the price. Is that this one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's, that's in my EO yeah. report, this, that, that going out to bid. Yeah. So uh, you're saying this is about 25000 Yeah. Okay. You're welcome to go down that road. Just um, and then again, what will happen is if we approve it for the full amount, mm -hmm. um, the 9800 uh, when that check comes in, we'll go back and we're okay. just trying to speed okay. up the process if we can yeah, to make sure the kids can start getting their hours in again. Okay, do I have a motion to approve this special allocation of money for from the uh, reserve fund for this um, driver's ed car? So, so, can I make that motion? Yeah. Second. You make that motion. <laughs> just went through this. Oh, and your no, second? No. Yep. Same thing. Oh. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Um, and we've got transportation reserve funds, and this is for the Ford F-250 truck. Yeah, it's an additional truck. Um, we have a couple of the members that are driving their personal vehicles around at 55 cents a mile. Uh, the trucks are fairly inexpensive on state contract, plus it's another good vehicle to have. We usually outrig them with a snow plow and the sanders on the back. They can help out in the, in the wintertime um, with that yeah. work. Um, so this would be coming from the, the same transportation reserve fund as the car. There's currently $1.1 in there right now. Um, typically what that money is used for is um, there's about $4,000. Um, actually, that's in the regular budget. But that money is used for is typically bus replacement. Um, but we do budget in the regular budget for bus replacement anyway. Any other questions for Lane on this uh, request? Just going to wake me up tonight. Make that motion too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll second that one. Just because. Uh, that one's under state Ford, contract. Ford F-250 truck. All right. So Rachel, move that. Second. I'll second it. Yeah. All those in favor to approve this? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That carries as well. Um, then we've got the confidential master agreement. This was for what we call the confidential of employees. Yep, so about seven, seven employees, primarily the confidential secretaries. Um, it was just a couple of wording changes. Uh, a lot of it was to, to bring it more in line with what like the support staff and, and the teachers have. Um, so the only wording changes uh, are this. Uh, the first is to make it a two-year agreement. Right, the state will be renegotiating health care in two years, um, so it's not prudent to actually have agreements that go beyond that because we don't know what the financial impact of those negotiations will be. Um, the next change is allowing them to carry their yearly vacation leave through Labor Day. Right now they have to have it used up by July 1st or they lose it, um, which doesn't make sense that they got that whole summer there mm -hmm. and they can't use it during the summer, which is when we'd rather have them out anyway if they're going to be out. Makes sense. Um, provides uh, three days of bereavement leave. Um, they have no provision for any kind of bereavement leave under any category at this point in time. Um, and that's exactly to what's in the support staff contract. Um, and then the last thing is um, just making sure that the health care coverage is in line with the, the new state agreement. Any questions about this um, confidential employee agreement? Um, let's approve this outside of the consent agenda as well. So do I have a motion to approve the confidential staff appointment agreement? I make a motion to approve the confidential master agreement. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That carries as well. So let's go back and um, approve the minutes if there are no amendments to those. And the signers for tentative agreements being Pietro and, if necessary, Lane. 
Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. I'm kind of hogging the motion. No, go for it. <laughs> I'll second it. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, uh, moving on to reports and incidentals. Uh, Lane, I'm going to lengthy superintendent's report. Do you have anything to add or elaborate on in that? No, just a little piece on the financials. Um, I did follow up the lettering order. Um, it's just making sure that uh, the lettering in the detail matches the lettering on the summary page, which makes sense. Um, there is one quirk there that I want to point out. Um, if you go to E on the expenditures page up towards the top under driver's education, if you take a look, um, it says that it is overspent by $5,394. Um, I was talking with Robin a little bit about why that was today, because that shouldn't be occurring. Um, they were accidentally drawing um, the benefits, the health care benefits, um, for that position from this line. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be corrected in the next report. Um, for whatever reason, they figured that's where it should be being pulled from. It's not. It should be being pulled out of the health care line like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that will be corrected next month. But other than that, everything is, is where it should be. You know, we're a little over halfway through the year. 48% um, of the budget has been, been spent, which is not what it should be. It should be around 50% going to take a little bit. Unless there's questions on that or superintendent's report. In the report, Wayne, uh, you mentioned um, the overtime they should reduce the cost uh, uh, for the uh, support staff or special education service delivery at the elementary schools. Based on what Nora was saying, uh, what, what are your thoughts? So she's asking for, it sounds like, take your time doing it and I didn't get the impression that you were talking about eliminating a whole bunch of people immediately, and I, so there, there, what, there are the, six six support staff. We have twenty six. So okay. uh, to put are it, you talking about paras here? Talking paras. So okay. want, six para. Is that what you said? So I want I want to put it in perspective. There's twenty six paras across 20. the district. We currently have one para for every three to four special education students extremely high. Um, it's not unusual across the state of Vermont, and one of the reasons it's not unusual um, was because paras were less expensive. Um, so what would happen is a student would move into the district, we put a pair on them, they manage the situation, but the student's not getting any better. Right? They're keeping the kid, and you know, they can focus while they're here, they may do some learning, but the true issue that the student has um, they're not learning the skills to become independent um, with a para. And so all we're doing is we're taking six of those paras, using that money to purchase an additional 2.5 special educators who can provide that service. Mm -hmm. Am I 100% sure that that matrix is right um, for next year? No. We'll have to adjust it a little bit after we learn um, through next year. But I purposely overdid it. Mm -hmm. I tried to make sure they had much more um, than they needed, especially given that it was a transition year. Um, so um, uh, six paras, uh, but again, they're being transferred into uh, purchasing um, special educators. Nora's comments, which is correct, is that there are, um, you know, the behavioral issues, um, but we've tried to put in supports for that in previous years, right? We have the therapeutic sure. program, we've got the adjustment counselor here, um, and we've been building in those parts and pieces because even the special educators with some of those students, they can't deliver those services. Um, we're also hiring um, a school psychologist. Um, the reason being is that they can work with some of the, the heavy hitters. Again, those are services that uh, a special education teacher is not going to be able to provide in terms of emotional disturbance. Um, right now, they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on contracting out of district to try to provide those services for the students. Um, I can hire a teacher from uh, the school psychologist for you know, 93000 including benefits, to do the same job, get more out of them, and um, help the kids. So that's kind of where we're at. Is that going to be a district-wide employee? Yep. So, so that person will serve all, th yeah. all the schools? So what they're going to focus on primarily is the, the higher level testing that has to go on. Mm -hmm. right? The students mm -hmm. have to be, t be tested. Um, and then if there's time left over, if there's one or two or, or three big heavy hitters in the district that really need some, some um, psychological service in their service delivery grid, 
um, we'll be able to provide that. Mm. Uh, doesn't mean that we're not going to we're going to be able to get away from um, contracting out, but it should cut the cost significantly. Because that's um, a huge cost. Those contracts out. Yeah, you know, one hundred to three hundred dollars an hour. Yeah. I have a question about the allocating of our principals. I mean, we now have three elementary school principals, and I thought that that meant that those principals were assigned to the smaller schools. They are. Um, but principals are sick, and principals are also go off to their trainings. Um, so those are days that there's not that body in the school. Um, you know, I'm typically out anywhere from one to two days a week at different conferences and whatnot to serve in my, my capacity um, across the state with the, the VSA that Jeff Francis runs and, and whatnot. Um, so, you know, there is a legitimate concern on that piece. Um, it's better now um, than it was, but it's, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, guidance we increased last year to, to help out. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big staff increases that we had last year. Is there guidance in the elementary schools? Mm -hmm. yeah, Part-time. Part, uh, well, we increased it to full-time last year. Well, I know Brookfield doesn't have a full-time person. Uh, she's she's shared to, between Braintree and Brookfield. Yeah, I have to. I have to go back and look, but her time between the two schools doubled last year. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we've been trying to build build it in as we can. Um, the nursing piece, um, we're within what the acceptable limits are for nurses per kid, um, but it is not ideal. I mean, that certainly could could be addressed. Uh, they have not talked about it before. They didn't mention the principal piece before today mm -hmm. here. You know, it was one of the things I was working on anyway as of, as of last year. Yeah, I feel like we had that yeah. discussion. Uh, the, the nursing piece is, is, a, is an important one, um, I think, that's going to have to be brought up uh, just because of the, the number of students that we serve that have critical needs and our enrollments are going up. So that, that changes things as the enrollments go up, we will need more staff. So you Brookfield and Braintree share nurses that have a... Yep. Any other questions for Lane? Yeah, the book field, I think, you know, was you know, usually three days a week or more, but there was not a principal. So, um, that was out from days, and that 80% rule is going to be 80%. Is that right? When you're having your your superintendent forums, are folks coming and, and cause these are means questions, these are about how are you running the schools, they're not really, I mean, it's information for us to know, but you're mm -hmm. you're deciding these. Things. This is the first time the the faculty have mentioned mm -hmm. principal or nurse mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Do you engage some with the staff? I mean, have the staff come to you from the yep. small schools to say we our principal's not? Uh, I'm meeting. I'm one of the big things this year. Uh, they usually show up at the open forums, the the ones that are interested, like we had tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but a big thing this year is quarterly is going in and having a full faculty meeting. They had the one with the elementary, the second round, a few weeks back for about mm -hmm. an hour and a half, and that was an open forum sort of session. Uh, we did talk a lot about the um, special education changes and the reason for it and what we're hoping to accomplish um, at that point in time. So yeah. Is that done with their with their principal present typically? I mean, is this? Oh, they they were there. Um, there there was nothing in the conversation that they wanted to have that would have been affected by that. And at the time, they're not shy, and they're good people. They got a lot of a lot of good 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 insights and things. Uh, but no, that was one of the big things this year. Is quarterly is getting in front of the full faculty to talk about what we're working on. Um, talk a little bit about data. Um, the first meeting, especially with the elementary. Um, Combined elementary was really just giving them a lot of credit for how well things have advanced academically in the schools the last two years. That was have come a long way. Um, they're, they're surging in terms of the performance of the kids. So, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Our self evaluation, your, your last <laughs> answer. Mm. Well. I think we did very well. I think we we followed our agenda. We didn't get sidetracked. We stuck to, and when we did backtrack on the agenda, it was for the you know for the purpose of public engagement, which is an excellent reason to do so. Um, we didn't. There was no one person dominating the discussions here. We all were 
open and honest and trusting of each other. There is no disrespect or discourteous behavior. And that is to our highest standards. So kudos. Have a good that was a good thing. Good board meeting. Thank you to both Melody and Anne for your service on this board. Yeah. We'll miss you both. Mm. You might see me out there. Is this it? Yeah. It's the last one? Wow. Oh, Maybe you'll my. come to the budget information meeting. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, we will of miss course. you at our regular board meeting. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you've done. Mm -hmm.